So I think we ended up with uh, talking about this case, which was an incomplete subchondral fracture, or what is usually termed a stress fracture. Okay. Uh, Taysen, what do you think of this case? So I think there is a subchondral yeah, fracture yeah, of the... Oh, you made it, John. Good. Yeah, so subchondral fracture, uh, medial. Well, John, we're just starting right now. Okay, so here we can see linear low signal intensity, which is fractured trabecular bone, which are causing dephasing of the spins, and therefore you have the low signal intensity. And then we've got the edema around it, which is probably kind of hemorrhage into the into the blood from the from the fractured trabecular there. And then the main thing here is also this is the immediate subchondral bone. So that means that there really is no mechanical support to the subchondral bone in this location. So if you weight bear on this, there's nothing to keep this subchondral plate from impacting into the bone. So this would be a high risk lesion. So I would this is something that I would call someone about uh, just to let them know that it's a that it's a high risk lesion. All right, so now it looks like we have a lot of edema in that lateral femoral condyle. I don't see a discrete fracture. Okay, so well, this is another low field scanner. You know, maybe there's a little low signal intensity right there that I'd be a little worried about, but sure. it could just be the normal low signal bone, but, but I would be concerned about that, especially with all this edema. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, and this is 427.04. Now, in the early days, in the early 1990s, these were called geographic lesions. By uh, there was a group out of uh, uh, Canada, uh, Fowler and Vallette. Vallette was a radiologist. Fowler was an orthopedic surgeon, and they did a study where they followed up on these and found it that they found that these uh, uh, geographic lesions were were high risk lesions. They did immediate arthroscopy and then a follow up arthroscopy, and they found that. These led to a high percentage of patients having uh, normal cartilage on the first arthroscopy and torn cartilage on the second arthroscopy. Uh, and we think the mechanism is that they get depression of the bone and it no longer supported it. Uh, this one, so, so this is on 4.2704. Uh, here the patient came back. This is 5.19. Why I'm sorry. This is a prior. This this is now. This was a prior MR scan that was done on this low field scanner, showing what normal looks like. And then clearly, uh, this is uh, abnormal, which we all do. So, but the, this was in the uh, early days when people didn't completely understand what all these this bone edema was all about. Uh, uh, thank, uh, yeah. Do you have a? after um, arthroscopy? Uh, I don't have in any of these with arthroscopy. Okay. That was just a published study by Fowler and Vallette. And I should have that reference here, but I, I don't have it. Okay, 52-year-old Indian female after knee trauma. We have... Uh, CTs of the knee. Um, I see an effusion with a fat fluid level, uh, suggestive of a fracture with. Uh, so here's some more images. Yeah, there's a, a fracture of the lateral tibial plateau. Right. Depression. You see, it's depressed, and we can see on CT, we can see the increased density where the fractured trabecular bone is impacted each other, and that's that impacted fractured trabecula that leads to susceptibility artifact and loss of signal intensity, which gives us the dark line that we see on MR. Okay, here's what the MR looks like in this particular case. Sure, uh, we have uh, curvilinear low signal in the lateral tubule plateau with edema on the PD fat sat. 
Um, and, yeah. and here we can see the actual hemorrhage along the area of the trabecular bone, and that's producing higher signal intensity on the fluid sensitive images rather than just that dark low signal intensity at this at this particular stage in this particular patient. And there are the sagittal images. We can see the depression. Yeah. And that's an older study, isn't it? I mean, uh, more recent. Uh, well, the, As I step in, the, the lateral the plateau is depressed. Yeah, it was depressed on the CT as well, John. See, it's depressed here. Yeah, well. right. Yeah, they, they, these were obtained, I think, a day apart from each other. Okay. So it's an acute impacted fracture. And then, and this is just another MR scan where we can see another impacted fracture, and we can see that it's really a complete fracture going into the uh, tibial plateau with an impacted uh, loose body in there as well. So those were kind of examples of what in the early days we called type 2 injuries to the bone. And then there was a type 3, uh, which was really very low in signal intensity. It looks like this excuse me, where we really have black signal here. Another example where it's really black on either side, and you guys have all seen this. This is typically associated with marginal osteophytes. Uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, but this is really sclerotic bone. And on uh, uh, x-ray-based techniques, uh, you see uh, increased density in these areas due to the sclerosis. This is, again, what it looks like on a T1-weighted image, very dark. All the other, the edema patterns we've been seeing on T1 is gray. This is really black because it's new bone formation. And here's an, another example. And you've all seen this. This is clearly almost always associated with denudation of the articular cartilage or grade 4 chondromalacia. Uh, and this is really uh, chronic degenerative disease, <coughs> not, not acute uh, in nature. And here's a... And the old, the old days, we just had PD, and uh, we had t, kind of a, a PD and a T2, uh, double echo technique, and not a technique which has been used for many years. Uh, <clears throat> and then we uh, first came up, and then maybe there's a little signal loss in here on the true T2, old-fashioned T2. Uh, it's still uh, fairly dark there. But then a newfangled thing called fat suppression came onto the scene, and here's an axial image, and we can actually see in that particular area, we can see the bone edema. Now, you've all, you guys have all been in the era where fat suppression is commonplace in musculoskeletal imaging. This was one of the first uh, fat-suppressed MSK images that were obtained uh, back in the uh, late 80s or early 1990s. Uh, showing this uh, high sensitivity for the edema. Uh, here's a similar situation. This, uh, as you can see, right and left hips, a little low signal intensity on the T1-weighted image here, much more prominent uh, on, the, uh, on the other side. And here are the fat-suppressed sequences uh, where we can see that extensive bone edema here, uh, also other things. But uh, uh, so uh, now uh, fat-suppressed images are pretty much considered essential on all studies, though, as I've warned over and over again, you can't fat suppress everything because fat is still a, a wonderful contrast agent, a natural contrast agent for musculoskeletal disease. Okay, and this is a case you guys have seen before as well. A patient had a uh, uh, varus injury. We can see a traction injury here with edema involving the uh, uh, origin of the lateral collateral ligament. Uh, <clears throat> we don't see edema uh, down in the fibular head. If we go to the T1-weighted images, we can actually see that the major problem here is not the uh, traction injury here, which is going to heal. It's minimally displaced, but we actually have a displaced fracture. And this just shows that uh, occasionally, if you have traction fractures, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you won't get a uh, prominent edema on the fat su suppressed images. If it's a compression fracture, you almost always get trabecular fractures and edema and hemorrhage into the bone. But if it's a traction, sometimes uh, the you will 
uh, not see a lot of edema on the fluid sensitive images and you can see it much better on the T1 weighted images or in our case we typically always have a T2, a fast spinaco T2 which also gives us good fat contrast. And that's the medial impact, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you're right. So it's a, a varus injury, right. You're right, John. So it's traction on the lateral side and uh, right. could, be, could be compression on the medial side, but we don't see compression here. Almost always, uh, it's, it's worse um, before you get the MRI. So what we then found in the early 1990s with the first group of uh, 250 some odd knees scans that we did in Santa Barbara, that x-ray occult bone injuries were quite common. Uh, and uh, the high signal intensity we get is hemorrhage from the trabecular fractures. And the prognosis really depends upon where the fracture is located. And if it's immediately adjacent to weight bearing uh, articular cartilage, then it has a poor prognosis, which we know from the studies from Ballet and Fowler. If it's farther away, uh, not immediately adjacent to weight-bearing cartilage, then trabecular bone injuries uh, have a, a high likelihood of healing without sequela. Okay. Status post hip replacement. So I see uh, extensive edema surrounding the uh, left femur. Um, and uh, this just shows that uh, <clears throat> they, they, they started walking again and they had a, a overuse and actually developed both soft tissue and a little bit of subtle bone edema from overuse after uh, they got a hip replacement and started ambulating again. Okay. So it kind of shows a little bit of physiology. Uh, I think we already talked about this. This basically shows thickened cortex up in the diaphysis. I'm repeating myself. Uh, 80 or 90, 95% of the weight is through the cortex. When we get down toward the articular surface, you can see that the cortical bone becomes very thin because you're not having much weight transfer there. You actually transfer the weight from the cortical bone into the trabecular bone in the metaphysis and in the epiphysis so that you can have a large contact surface where you have articular cartilage. And as I said, if you have a given pressure coming down, which would be body weight, I mean, a given force coming down, which is body weight, the pressure across an area would be that uh, that force divided by the cross-sectional area. The larger the cross-sectional area, the less the pressure. So this is an anatomy that's developed over uh, the millennia uh, to preserve the articular cartilage. Okay, and then this just shows another one of Vallette's uh, 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 Geographic lesions, it's high risk, another high risk lesion here, 6504. Here we can see the uh, trabecular bone compressed here, the 72204 in the area of the subchondral fracture. Here's another geographic lesion. In this case, we can actually see that there's some compression and deformity of the subchondral plate. So this, uh, we're already at very high risk in this case because we already have deformity of the bone. Uh, this patient is older, so this highly likely will end up uh, leading to cartilage loss and grade four conjugation. In a lot of kids, you can have a fair amount of subchondral deformity, but they have thickened uh, articular cartilage and they can get a lot of remodeling uh, and uh, actually their prognosis can be better. And there's just the, the edema. Um, this just shows that we've found some difference in contrast between PD fat set and STIR, where often the STIR will pick up the compressed trabecular bone a little bit more sensitively than the PD fat set. Okay, Taysom. 
All right, so we're looking at a pediatric knee MRI. Um, so it looks like at the weight-bearing medial femoral condyle, we have a osteochondral injury, uh, slightly impacted. Yeah, so here we can see it slightly impacted. See, there's bone edema in the epiphyseal bone here, the subchondral bone. But here it looks like the oblique cartilage is still pretty much intact. Okay. So this is another uh, one of those bone out lesions. <clears throat> and these are important because this has become a big topic in orthopedics now. You guys heard about it when Mandelbaum was talking about it in his lecture a few weeks ago. But uh, <clears throat> it's still relatively unknown, I think, in a lot of radiology circles. But remember, the articular cartilage, and I'm repeating myself again, uh, is soft tissue, it's malleable, it can actually have direct impact and deform without being torn. The trabecular bone, however, is rigid. If you deform it, it's going to fracture. So this is a case where we really have a subchondral fracture, delamination injury, but the overlying cartilage is intact. These are very important lesions because they, they have a relatively poor prognosis. But again, you can't it's you detect this at arthroscopy by this is belotable and it's soft in this particular area. Uh, but uh, just visually the the surface is still going to be intact. So uh, these are lesions that uh, that Mandelbaum wants to do a study on and try to understand better in terms of the management, and in particular whether uh, a uh, uh, separation, uh, what, the, what are the best ways to treat this separation in different age groups of patients. Mm -hmm. And then here, this the sagittal image is showing it. John? Autogenous uh, bone. Uh, slurry from the medial side or what lateral side, whatever the problem is, and inject it with an okay with like an 18 gauge needle. Right, uh, that's something that I've been thinking about for this condition for years. Good, thank you. But uh, I'm in no position to try that stuff. So. <laughs> but, then, but then you have to get the study approved, and that's not going to be easy. Yeah. But now we we have uh, um, cord um, um, frozen after each birth, um, and. Uh, so you can make tissue out of any kind of tissue you want, pretty much. Yeah. So you can make uh, a tissue to to implant there. Good. And so here we can see another impacted fracture, and we've already seen this case before. This is a sharp area of bone, highly likelihood in someone of this age that this is going to tear, end up having tearing the articular cartilage, and leading to problems. And this is just. Uh, another case that you've already seen where we have an impacted fracture here. And then if they came back uh, uh, a few years later, we can see the degenerative changes in the subchondral cystic disease in these low field images. Well, well, with walking, what happens is you have repetitive trauma to that area and it just um, goes kaput. Yep, that's right. So this was a young volleyball player, also these are old images, about 1990, came in to evaluate for meniscal tear. All right, so it does look like there's a vertical tear, that posterior horn of the medial meniscus, and yeah. uh, some edema in that. So in this case, I'd, I didn't want to, I would then, my, the next thing I'd look at would be the ACL here. Right. The ACL was fine. Uh, so it was recommended that this patient get arthroscopy for a partial meniscectomy. This was in 1990. Yeah, it's not uh, nowadays. We know that this is a peripheral tear. It's a red red zone. These are highly likely to to heal. Uh, you may want to go in, uh, but if you do go in arthroscopically now, you would want to repair this 
and stabilize it to let it heal. You would not want to do a partial meniscectomy. But this patient actually refused the surgery. But the other thing that we saw here was over here. This, again, is a T1-weighted image, early imaging. What do you see on the right side, on the uh, lateral side? It looks like there's some edema there, some loss okay. of blood. So we see a lot of edema here. And so we're trying to figure out at this time, uh, when we saw this bone edema, is that symptomatic or not? Because a lot of these patients also had meniscal tears. So uh, they followed the patient. The patient came back, and we did a free MR scan four weeks later, and this is what it looked like. Uh, so it looks like that edema is resolved, and it looks like there's some probably granulation tissue in that yeah. meniscus. So at this point, the patient was asymptomatic and was actually playing volleyball again. Well, the, the patient's uh, injury is, is the tear is way posterior, and... Uh, that's a blood, blood, good blood supply in that area. So, right. Um, we don't have, uh, we don't know how far uh, immediately this goes, but uh, that, I, w I wouldn't have surgery in this either. Yeah, well, well, they didn't. And uh, as I say, the patient, uh, was pretty much asymptomatic, the, the, the bone had healed. And a year after this, I talked to the orthopedic surgeon about it and said the patient was uh, full activity, doing fine with, without any symptoms. So, okay. So this is when we started thinking that maybe these bone injuries were the more likely cause of symptoms rather than the meniscal tear, which, which we now know the bone injuries are much more likely to be symptomatic than the meniscal tears. Okay. okay, so looking at the lateral tibial plateau, we see some uh, hypo-intense, T1 hypo-intense signal, subchondral signal. Could be a subchondral fracture. Yeah, so this would be another one of uh, Valette's geographic lesions. <clears throat> we know it's high risk. This is another one that if you don't know the orthopedic surgeon or uh, that you need, to, it's worth calling and just letting them know this is a high-risk lesion. I think these should be taken off weight-bearing uh, for a couple of weeks to allow the trabecular bone to heal. But uh, uh, generally, they're treated carefully, but but symptomatically, and if the patients don't have symptoms, the orthopedic surgeons will often let them weight bear. Uh, I would put them on weight bearing when the pain is gone. Yeah. Okay, there's a, here's a patient that came in with classic symptoms of meniscal tear. Okay, so it looks like there is a linear low signal subchondral yeah. um, or medial medial tibia, medial this, femoral This patient, again, this is in the early 90s, was scheduled for arthroscopy. The menisci looked fine. We saw this subchondral bone injury. They decided not to operate on the patient, but to treat them conservatively with crutches, and the patient did well. Uh, who came up with the word of classic meniscal tear? The orthopedic surgeon, that was the history that was, uh, that was, uh, came in with the patient. Uh, I've never seen a classic meniscal tear. Okay. Because <laughs> every, every, every tear I've ever seen was different. Well, uh, they meant that the, the patient's symptoms were classic for meniscal tear. Well, uh, uh, here again, uh, I, I, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Was there giving way? Was there clicking? Was there uh, severe pain? Then was the pain when when the patient lay down? Was the pain when the patient was up? Was the pain with motion? Uh, what was the other side normal? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when somebody John, says classic meniscal tear. I wish we could get all our patients from you so we could get that kind of a history. <laughs> we never get that kind of history. I know. You, the, the radiologists do not get a history. No. 
Uh, I think I showed this case before. Again, this is just a subcontinent bone injury in this NBA all-star player. The MR scan showed this impaction injury and a full thickness cartilage defect. And as you guys know, we followed this patient with like 18 MR scans over a couple of years. And this just shows some healing, more degenerative change at this point. And this was a career-ending injury, and he really wasn't able to go back to playing. The interesting thing about this is that uh, this is soon right after the injury. We don't the images were really poor because this is really early on, uh, but we didn't actually see a subchondral defect. He continued to try to practice after this MR scan was done and finally developed too much pain during a practice session. That's why he came back four weeks later to see this. I've always wondered if uh, we'd actually recognize what was going on here at the time and taking him out of activity for that four weeks, let it heal, uh, whether it would not have gone on to this. And this ended up being a career-ending injury, as I talked about before. So, uh, but, but we were concerned about this. Uh, this guy actually played in Denver at the time. And uh, this place, case was kind of uh, discussed in, in the sports world. And after this, people started thinking about these as being high-risk lesions. Uh, this is about the same time that Valent and Fowler published their paper. And these uh, began being treated much more aggressively and uh, uh, after this particular patient. But that still could be treated. Right, it could be now. In those days, they, they didn't really have good treatment for Yeah, I understand this about, this is ancient history, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, back when you and I were practicing. In the days when, when we were um, a, a little more capable. <laughs> It's a 59 year old with new onset knee pain. It looks like there's a lot of edema in that medial femoral condyle. Yep. So that's 41118. So this would be subchondral trabecular bone injury. I'd be a little bit concerned about this. So I would uh, consider this a high risk lesion. So this is 41808. And then this is about six months later. This is what it looked like. All right. Some of that edema looks like it's improved, but there's still some pretty intense edema there, and there's irregularity of the overlying cartilage. So. Yeah, so this is really uh, impacted in, in the interval. So uh, uh, this patient uh, uh, re really should have been kept off weight bearing for a longer period of time to allow that to heal. Um, I, I keep saying that. I can't stop doing that. Uh, when the patient has pain, Get him off weight bearing. Yep. I mean that's a, that's a animals when they have pain they don't use the extremity. So uh, yeah, you know I, I think MR has really changed a lot in sports. I think uh, uh, certainly we know that it's affected Major League Baseball pitchers. They have much longer lifespans now than they did before MR as we understood uh, the risks associated with overuse of the elbow and uh, Tommy John procedure and so forth. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, these bone injuries should be properly interpreted, especially in athletes, and should treat these much more aggressively rather than the old days where you're supposed to play through the pain. Now pain is a marker of, of injury, and you've got to if it's it, it's the onus is really on the physician, the radiologist, to determine whether it's a high risk lesion or not. If it is, well, there was a time uh, there was a time, John, when chiropractors were uh, team doctors, uh, and and um, GPs were team doctors, and uh, they couldn't read X-rays and they couldn't read uh, MRIs when they came around or CAT scans before that right. uh, so the, 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 a lot of progress has been made um, but I I have a feeling that we could have done a lot more however we were treating um, disease de jour um, yeah. at a period of time in the 80s mainly AIDS 
that, that, that really put all the money in that pot instead of orthopedics. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, th this is why I think it's important for the radiologist to understand the pathophysiology that's occurring here. Okay. Uh, 64, two weeks pain after hearing a pop, four months after surgery. Well, what stands out is these subchondral irregularity, the medial femoral condyle. So it's a big osteochondral defect. Here. Yes. And there's a sagittal images. Uh, let's see, complete loss of the subcondral bone in these large cystic areas. And that was after surgery. Right. That's right. No, but do we know what kind of uh, surgery was done? I, I, I don't remember, John. I don't, See I don't what remember. I mean when you I, um, I, leave I, the... Uh, uh, 20 years ago? Yeah. I think the surgery was a partial meniscectomy. And uh, well, I, somebody I, screwed up and really put pressure on that condyle. Yeah. Well, and that was not unusual. Yeah. Uh, well, if you do a partial meniscectomy and you remove 30% of the meniscus, you increase, uh, substantially increase the force uh, that's that's transmitted uh, in focal areas to the subchondral bone. Remember the, well, the meniscus is responsible. The, put the scope in so tight that, uh, that, that they uh, the the, and, and contuse that, that area. Uh, right. Uh, some, right. Some guys that didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, that, that was not unusual. Yeah. Okay. Um, I remember when I. Um, had a big battle with the orthopedic surgeons in our local area when I was on the committees um, because I wanted to see the meniscal tissue that they took out um, and have the, the pathologist report it yeah. as to what they find. And I was voted down. They didn't want the pathologist to look at it. Right. Um, which was kind of interesting. Yeah. I was the only guy in the committee that wanted the, uh, that document. Mm. Jason. All right. Because I, so we have a high grade tear, proximal ACL, uh, labial arthrosis. Probably more the midsection here. Okay. Great, I think it's a grade three, and then a hemarthrosis here, right? Yeah. And then some funny signal here within the the uh, uh, trabecular bone. There we can see that. Yeah, here are the this uh, T1 and a stir coronals on a one Tesla scanner. Okay, so it looks like there's been an injury to the lateral tibial plateau. Okay, and then stuff in here. Then what's happening here? Yeah. Um, looks like it's impacted there. Well, I think there's an avulsion of the iliotibial band attachment to the tibia here. Okay. Which is uh, known to be uh, a not common, but, but a recognized injury in ACL tears. Yeah. Is there some segun kind of thing? Yeah. And if we go far more, if we go posteriorly, what do you see here? Uh, I'm not sure. So that's a segun fraction. Okay. This is an avulsion of the anterior lateral. Oh, 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 darn, I was right. <laughs> You're always right, John. So, if you look at the meniscus, it's kind of interesting location for it. Yeah. It's uh, not exactly where it's supposed to be, is it, John? Uh, it's a little, a little displaced there. Yeah. Yeah, and that and the little displaced uh, doesn't allow the meniscus to act like a 
normal structure. Right. And uh, so you get problems. And I think there's a deem on that condyle right above that meniscus. Yes, that's cr that's true. Oh, shoot. All right, all right again, I'll be darned. Yes. So it looks like there's I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say anything. I'll say it after you say something. All right. So it looks like there's another Sagan avulsion fracture okay. at the tip of plateau. But one thing different, this is a child. Right. Yeah. yeah. The joint effusion. But to all do it. And, and what's the difference between a child and an adult in terms of ligaments? Uh, I think the ligaments are stronger in a child than the bone. And darn right. And that's, so, so that does not necessarily mean that the, uh, the ligament is torn. In adults, you can almost bet 99% of the time that it's torn. Actually, I think there is a tear, uh, uh, which we probably have here is a, a bone avulsion of the ACL, okay. where the ACL is incompetent here, mm -hmm. and that probably was a tear that was a fracture of the bone, maybe a little bit of an injury to the ACL, but I think that we have a it's, it's not a tibial attachment. Mm -hmm. But this patient went to surgery. Because uh, I, and I think we were concerned about that. And at surgery, uh, they they felt that the ACL was intact. Uh, but I, uh, I'm pretty sure that this is displaced bone here. So that this patient actually had a Sagun fracture, uh, and it was thought to be in someone who had intact surgery. But I think what we see here is, I mean, an intact ACL. I think we can see the ACL is incompetent because. Part of the fracture here that made the ACL insufficient. Well, that, that, that's usually the like situation that kids. It's, yeah. Look for fractures. Okay, so along the tibial diaphysis. We see bone edema. Uh, the cortex appears intact. There's also some adjacent soft tissue edema. Um, hmm. So what would you call this? Well, it could be a stress, a stress fracture. Yeah, I keep using this term, but it's a, it's a it's the term. So this is, uh, uh, these are typically due to overuse, chronic repetitive trauma, typically in people who start running. And you do uh, tubercular fractures at a greater rate than the body can heal it. And you end up uh, coalescing into uh, uh, to larger and larger fractures. My prostate cancer left side pain. Um, so I see a focal area corpal thickening with uh, some edema, right? The uh, lateral lateral cortex. Okay. There's your bone scan. Okay. Uh, yeah, focal uptake in that region, but that's still pretty non-specific. Could be like a fracture or a mat. Yeah, but if we go back again, uh, METs usually occur predominantly centered in the medullary bone. Okay. This looks like it's primarily involving cortical bone. Cortical bone is a rare place for, for METs to be primarily located. And, uh, uh, and again, this looks like it's really on the periphery, uh, centered in the cortex. This is what the X-ray looks like. Okay. Um, I guess I would... Wonder if this guy was getting uh, some dysfunction. Repetitive stress. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this was an overuse stress fracture. And uh, once you, when you put in a hip replacement, uh, one of the areas at risk is the opposite side once they start ambulating. So this is a stress fracture and not, we could, we could quite confidently tell him it's not a MET. John? And the patient uh, may have been very sedentary and uh, osteoporotic to yeah. some extent um, because of the hip. And uh, then once the patient started ambulating, um, this part of the, uh, the, the other side versus the hips replacement side was taking all the stress. Yeah. Um, that, that's the old type of uh, hip replacement. The new ones, you, you you start walking right away. Right. With right. full weight bearing. Yeah. And you can see there's also probably some stress to the facet joint here, 5 1. All right. So cellulitis rule out osteomyelitis. Looking at the tibia, it looks like there's some edema within the bone, kind of distal diaphysis. Uh, adjacent soft tissue edema as well, yeah. There's a sagittal images. I noticed something here. We can see a little bit of an area of edema right along mm -hmm. the cort cortex mm -hmm. anteriorly with some, maybe some subtle edema in the medullary bone. Mm -hmm. And then here are the... It's usually, it's usually just about the metaphysis, isn't it, John? Uh, yes. And then in the distal diaphysis. No. Uh, similar, looks like there's edema with some periosteal edema as well. Uh, maybe it enhances. So what's your diagnosis? Uh, I mean, I'd be concerned more about a stress fracture than... Yeah. So this is really kind of an obvious fracture. Uh, osteomyelitis, typically the edema is centered in the center of the medullary bone. The, and the, when you have stress fractures, the edema is often along the, the deep part of the cortical bone, especially anteriorly like this. So this is much more characteristic of a overused stress injury to bone rather than osteomyelitis. And, and, and the patient is probably not sick. Right. Okay, so here looking at the uh, tibial diaphysis, there's some T1 kind of hypotense signal in the medullary bone. Um, yeah, and some th irregular signal that cortex. Um, okay. This is where the patient is symptomatic. It's not as, there's also some abnormal signal within the subcondyl, uh, sub, subcutaneous mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. And this patient had a direct blow to the tibia, and this is a, a periosteal contusion. <clears throat> All right. So it looks like we have uh, extensive edema, medial, femoral condyle, and overlying subcutaneous edema as well. Yeah. Uh, large effusion. Oh, okay, yeah. So lipohemarthrosis. Lipohemarthrosis. We can see the different layers there. And then, right. Yeah. So this was a this was a yeah, impaction fracture from the puck. Yeah. We have a runner with pain. Uh, so we have some edema in that tibia. Again, some periosteal edema. And again, we can see the edema around a little bit of irregularity of that dorsal mm -hmm. cortex in this case, and this was a overuse fracture. This fracture, and then another. This was also a 
overuse, trabecular fracture. Okay. Okay, so radiographs of a young patient. Um, stands out as a transverse sclerotic line in the distal tibia, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe actually a more loosened lesion in the mid shaft. Yeah, because I'm loose and stay there. And it's like a little bit of endosteal scalloping in this little Okay. And this is just probably gross support for this. So you want an MR scan? Yeah. Yeah, it's running in the face. Let's get this one. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, on the T1, we have loss of the cortex, and the PD fat set, lots of edema in the bones. Well, you really have endoscopic scalloping here. Yeah. Which is important. A lot of periosteal reaction and edema. Mm -hmm. This funny signal tends to hear, and then a lot of defect in the cortex. Now, now we're in the tibia. The tibia is famous for a number of lesions, which we have to. Uh, figure out, and I, I don't know if I'm going to go through all of the, the 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 common ones right now, or whether we'll do it when we get to the tumor lecture. So, anyway, what do you think this diagnosis is? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be worried about a tumor. Okay, so what, what um, tumors are you worried about? Um, an osteo osteosarcoma. You want to think about infection first. Okay. Oh, infection? Okay, yeah. So, the, you know, the, the pen on so forth. So, this could be infection, could be osteomyelitis, it could be tumor. Okay. Tumors I would worry about would be Ewing sarcoma. Okay. And, uh, adamantinoma. This is, not, this is a typical location for an adamantinoma. You have to think about fibrous dysplasia and osteofibrous dysplasia, which look a lot like adamantinoma. And uh, what else in a kid like this do you have to think about? Whatever you think, local osteomyelitis. Mm. If the kid isn't sick, it's stress. Yeah. Uh, so this was a Ewing sarcoma. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had a chief that wanted to operate on a kid that uh, uh, we didn't have MRIs in those days. And I begged him that I could aspirate that area. A uh, similar case like this, two-year-old. Oh. And fi finally, he agreed that, to let me aspirate the area, and I got fuss out, saved the, saved the kid an amputation. Wow. <laughs> My chief was a, a, a little... Uh, well, yeah, I've read. That's a good job. It, it was uh, okay. Also, he used to treat normal feet if they were flat. Wow. Yeah, and the, and the teens. I'm sorry. I'm just blanking on the, and I, I, I this isn't where I'm having this this lecture, so I don't have. Uh, it's a it's a benign kind of inflammatory. Uh, disease, uh, chronic recurrent, multifocal. Little, the most malignant form is a little, little, little. So. Oh, uh, I, I think there uh, aren't there age age groups uh, where you little see Ewing's and osteomyelitis and, and like kids. Uh, Younger than three, uh, get osteomyelitis. Uh, I think. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I think there's some kind of a, 
um, relation to, to, to age. Okay. But I, I can't tell you what age is. Okay. Right. Six year old rule out tumor. Um, so in the proximal diaphysis, right femur, we see uh, extensive edema. Uh, the medial aspect of the vortex is thickened. Yeah. With a, yeah, another transverse line right there. So they worry about tumor here. Okay. All right, so there's, yeah, the thickened cortex uh, posterior medially with some periosteal yeah. edema. Yeah. What, does that, what does that tell you if they're thickening? That's uh, probably a chronic process of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, a... it's adding bone, not removing, so it's probably not yeah. a tumor. So, so this looks a lot like that stress fracture we saw in the yeah. femur, yep. here, right? So th this was actually a stress fracture, incomplete fracture. Oh, yeah, sedentary granuloma is what I was trying to think about. Yep. Sorry, I can't. I, uh, the, 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 that's important. To always recommend uh, remember uh, because that's treated very differently than the others. So it needs to be included in the differential so it's not forgotten. And they can become very sick, even systemically sick, literally swollen. Uh, anyway, uh, or, or they can just kind of have focal pain, but it looks very inflammatory. All right, so we have a 20 year old leg pain for four weeks. Soldier army training difficulty. Uh, again, it looks like there's a lot of edema in that tibia and periosteal edema and thickening yeah. of the cortex. Yeah, and a lot of edema within the cortex there, which means uh, the cortex is either infiltrated by something or microfractures mm -hmm. within it. And this is a typical soldier's march fracture. It's also called medial tibial stress syndrome, and there's a grading system for it, but that. And I think most people don't really use uh, all the way to a complete fracture line, and it starts out with just a periosteal ed edema. It just kind of shows the different grades of the stress fracture. And it's commonly called shin splints. And the different grades, uh, some people believe, are correlate with uh, return to play. Uh, whereas a complete fracture is nine to ten weeks, uh, I think that's a little bit longer than than normal. But but that's what they said here. Uh, why don't we stop here, and we'll pick up and uh, continue on uh, uh, bone injuries uh, on Monday. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. See you next, see you next week. See you next week. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend.